This past month, we've been studying Psalm 119 in the Bible. And I've been, of course, in my job, in my role here as pastor, I've been probably reading it a lot more than you have over the past month. One of the things I've been also doing is sometimes to the annoyance of my wife when I do it at like 11 o'clock at night, has been playing it on my app, my Bible app, on the audio. And there's this wonderful deep voice of a man that speaks. And I listen to it, just listening to it. But I've been growing a little envious of the psalmist. That this psalmist seems to, do you notice how he's been talking? He's talking to God as if God's in the exact room with him when he's speaking. You know, and he's not just speaking about God as kind of just up there away, but he's saying, you know, hear my cry for mercy. Like, are you listening? Where are you? He speaks about God's word being above every earthly treasure. He says it's better than wealth. It's better than approval of authority figures and kings. He says even at one point, I know more because when I hear you speak to me, I know more than any of the teachers that teach me. And it's more than any other love. Jesus, of course, said it, didn't he, in Matthew, that where you, what you treasure in life, there your heart will be focused on. What you treasure. He says, the psalmist said, they don't know if you caught that, I've hidden your word, Lord, in my heart. That's a word actually for treasure, too. I treasure your word in my heart. Now, to us, sometimes, I don't know about you, we hear those words so often, don't we, that they can just seem like words. But what would it be to have that power behind those words? Where they change your life, where they really have meaning in deep personal life, where you put those words on a tombstone to want everybody to see and hear what would that mean for you? I love that power of purity. How does a young person keep their way pure, right? How do they keep their way pure? Um, Jesus once said, Blessed are you who are pure in heart, he says, for you will see God. See God. What a promise. Purity is a word for moral goodness, right? A lot of people want to be, you ask people, well, I'm a good person. I want to be a good person, right? Like, moral goodness. But how many of us would drink a glass of water if it was contaminated with leaves, garbage, and spit from other people? None of us would want that kind of water to drink We'd be scared to drink it, afraid we'd get sick. Well, God's word, according to the, the psalmist, is to guide us so that we can be purified. So we don't become contaminated with the pollutants of life. A little bit of hatred, maybe. A little bit of dishonesty. Cheating. Bitterness. Self-absorption. What happens to our heart? It becomes contaminated. It's not fit for drinking, just like water, until those contaminants are removed. So how can a young person stay on the path of purity, the psalmist says? A young person, remember, isn't highly educated or experienced. They don't have a lot of life experience. No, a lot of older people like to say that. Oh, wait till you have gone through the experiences I've had. Right? Then you'll know what life's about. No, a young person needs training, wisdom, 
to help them grow to their full potential. And that encourages me, because that says, the psalmist is really saying, God's word is for all people, all generations. It helps guide the young child. It can also help guide the senior who has vast life experience and education. Gregory the Great, I don't, I don't know how he got the name of the Great, but he was a great church leader, maybe that's why. Now, I don't think anybody ever says Alan the Great yet. But he said, once said, Scripture is like a river. It's broad and it's deep. Shallow enough for the lamb to go wading, but deep enough for the elephant to swim. Isn't that good? Where do we start if we want to treasure God's word like the Psalms? He says at one point, verses 36 and 37, Turn my heart, God, towards your statutes, not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Now, imagine your living room. Now, some of you wonder, what does the pastor do each week in his office? Right? This is a chair for my office. And I put some things on this chair. This is really, when I first sat in this chair, I was quite impressed by this chair. You want to know why? I'll have to move some of the clutter. But this, kids, you love this chair. If you ever want to come in my office, you can. <laughs> this is the way to preach. This is the way to preach. I have a chair like this. Isn't that wonderful? I was always surprised. So, so if you ever catch me napping, you know, usually early afternoon is my worst time, so I sometimes need it. But... Imagine our living rooms have these kind of chairs. What do we even call them? Your dad might have one. What are they called? Lazy Boys, right? They're, they're even a brand name called Lazy Boy Chair, right? These are some of the things that I like to do in my living room, in my living room of my heart. Yes. I have sports. You know me, I like my baseball. And I like playing sports a lot. My boys and I really are into playing table tennis. We do that a lot, play table tennis a lot. <laughs> and of course, gotta all have Netflix, don't we? Yeah. My Netflix fix, my screens. Of course, I would want to say that God's Word is also with me in that time. And I'm spending time in God's Word. But we see that it's very easy, isn't it? There's so many things fighting for our attention nowadays. There's so many choices that we have. How do we make the best choices? Now, you think I might try to guilt you into saying, Choose the Bible, read the Bible over all these things. But I know from my own life that that hasn't worked. That hasn't worked. You know what has really helped the most? Is realizing first and foremost that God treasures me. God treasures spending time with us. God doesn't expect us arms folded waiting for us to come into the living room of our hearts with Him. But He invites us to in, spend time with Him, get to know Him, treasure that time with Him. That has helped me more than anything else in life of realizing when I go to God's Word, we can view it sometimes as always as like going to the dentist. Forgive if there's any dentists here. But the truth is, do we 
it should change our lives when we think that God wants to speak to me today. God wants me to know about His love. God wants me to know that no matter what everybody's saying in school, what everybody's saying at work, I am not worthless. I am valuable enough. And you know how God says that? In His Word. Because He says, you know what? Jesus came for you. That has changed my perspective on spending time in the Bible. More than anything. When I realized that it's just not about me spending time with God, but it's God treasuring me and spending time with me. I have a prayer for this congregation and for you that you can rediscover this year God's Word. That you can be envious like me of that psalmist where they feel like God's in the room with me. God's right here answering my cries for help and mercy. And our prayer is that you'll come and say, if you need help and you want to know how to read your Bible, that you will seek it out. And I would love to have my week being taken up by people saying, I want to know God's word more in my life. And I'm not going to come after you. I'm not going to come after you. That's got to come because you really believe that God treasures you and he wants to speak to you. So that's my prayer for us. I'm going to invite uh, Scott that's going to come up and lead us in our prayer of thanksgiving. Do we really know what we're doing when we pray? Do we really know what we're doing when we pray? First, a quote from Annie Dillard. Why do people in church seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The church is our children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be handing out life preservers. Okay. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be issuing life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews with ropes. Sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw near to us, or draw us to a place where we can never return. It's a long quote, but in summer, summary, in other words, if God displayed his full power to us, we wouldn't stand a chance, even if we're yielded with all of us. Now a story. Many years ago, there's a small farm community that experienced a, a terrible drought. The local pastor 
decided to, uh, to urge his congregation to pray, to, uh, to speak to God, to try to request rain. A prayer meeting was organized to petition God to be merciful and to cause life-giving water to pour from the heavens. Everyone gathered in the town square, but only one person, a little girl, actually brought an umbrella. We'll change, for the sake of the story, we'll change it to a little boy <laughs> instead of a little girl. Many people prayed for rain, but only one actually believed that it would come. If you have the opportunity to hear ghosts, sit back down and stay up here. Though. Sure. Oh, I'll stay up here. Perfect. <laughs> I'll be nice and dry. <laughs> if it does come. So how do you pray? Do you pray out of obligation? Because you have to. Do you pray out of routine? Because it's what we do. Or do you pray out of faith and out of hope that your Creator, your Father, will not only hear, but also answer. When you search for treasure, do you look for it like you're trying to find the pickles in the fridge, half-heartedly, half expecting to not find them? By the way, they are always behind the milk. Can you find somebody to give that to? Who'd like a jar of pickles? Who loves pickles? Oh, we got, we got some. Let me just make the decision. They can't go to Cole. <laughs> Cole, you have to give them to somebody else. <laughs> Who else likes pickles? <laughs> Gord likes pickles. You gotta really like pickles oh. because they're huge. In the corner, Cole. Definitely, definitely. All the way to the corner, buddy. <laughs> it's been my experience anyway that the pickles are always hiding. Never fun. You got car out? Yeah. Not. So when you seek, do you put a time limit on it? Like playing hide and seek when you're really not that interested in playing. You look for a little while, you get bored, and stop. Meanwhile, little Johnny falls asleep in the toy box because you took too long. Do you seek impatiently? Like when you're late for work and your keys have mysteriously disappeared. You rip off the couch pillows, frantically check your pockets for the third time, yelling at the kids and your spouse for taking them, only to find that they're still in the front door from when you unlocked it last night. Or do you seek biblically, with unswerving hope, knowing that God knows what you need even before you ask Him, knowing that God is faithful to His Word, knowing that Jesus Himself is praying for you and alongside you, do you pray with persistence? Not trying to coerce God into giving you what he wants, like a child. Can I have a cookie? 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 When the parent finally relents. Can you pass up some cookies? Who wants some uh, cookies? Where did you get some cookies? You want a cookie? We got But with a humble persistence that comes from knowing that all things work together in God's time for God's glory. Now, do we have a screen that has all those words up there at the same time? Okay, no, there's a different screen, that's okay. So which one, which of those seven words most describes your prayer life? Obligation, routine, faith, half-hearted, or bored, or impatient, or persistent. I think we all fall in different parts of those words at one point in our life, even from day to day or moment to moment. I believe we can only pray and seek the true treasures of heaven when we understand to whom we are praying. And the only way we can understand is by reading God's words to us, by discovering the treasure of Him revealing Himself to us. We all have Bibles. I'm assuming most houses like mine has probably four, five, six, seven Bibles in it. We all have Bibles. 
But like a treasure chest, this is completely useless unless it's open and enjoyed. In a few short passages in the Psalms and Isaiah, I literally spent less than five minutes on this, I found proof that God is gracious, righteous, compassionate, protector, helper, triumphant, teacher, preserver, promise keeper, faithful, comforter, love, eternal, creator, lamp, light, good, freedom giver, refuge, salvation, foundation, justice, merciful, magnificent, merciful, and strength. Knowing that this is who God is, we can seek Him and come to Him with great expectations. Now let's commune with this God right now. Let's pray. Father God, we are a weak and fragile people. Our attention spans are short. Our focus waxes and wanes. We want to know you. We want to trust you. But we don't take the time. We don't give you our time. We're half-hearted, impatient, lazy procrastinators when it comes to seeking you. Forgive us for our lukewarm attitudes. Draw us to you. You are our faith giver. We can't change on our own. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fan our desire for you into a raging flame. Reveal to us who you really are. From Scripture, Isaiah 30, 18 and 19, we know that you long to be gracious to us. You rise to show us compassion, as with the father of the prodigal son. You are a God of justice, and you bless all who seek you. You will be gracious to us when we humbly cry to you for help. You will answer. And from, I, and from Psalm 118, 14, You are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. And Isaiah 33, verse 5 through 6, You are exalted on high. You fill Zion with justice and righteousness. You are our sure foundation, a rich store, a treasure of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And the key to this treasure is a fear of the Lord. Instill in us a loving reverence for you with complete submission to your Lordship and to the commands of your word. And God, you put a song in my heart the last week and a half. Great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. You never waver or change. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, to me. Let the droughts of our lives cause us to seek you, for we know you will lead us to quiet waters and restore us. Amen.